Quantization, in general, can be defined as mapping values from a large set of real numbers to values in a small discrete set. Typically, this involves mapping continuous inputs to fixed values at the output. A common way we can think of achieving this is by rounding or truncating. In case of rounding, we compute the nearest integer. For example, a value of 1.8 becomes 2, but a value of 1.2 becomes 1. In case of truncation, we blindly remove the values from the decimal to convert the input to an integer. In whichever way we proceed, the main motivation behind quantization of deep neural networks is to improve the inference speed, as it's needless to say that inference and training of neural networks is computationally quite expensive. With the advent of large language models, the number of parameters in these models are only increasing, meaning that the memory footprint is only getting higher and higher. With the speed at which these neural networks are evolving, there is increasing demand to run these neural networks on our laptops, mobile phones, or even tiny devices like watches. None of this is possible without quantization. Before diving into quantization, let's not forget that trained neural networks are mere floating numbers stored in computers' memory. Some of the well-known representations or formats for storing numbers in computers are float32 or fp32, float16 or fp16, int8, bfloat, but b stands for Google Brain, or more recently, TensorFloat32, a specialized format for handling matrices or tensor operations. Each of these formats consume different chunks of memory. For example, float32 allocates 1 bit for sign, 8 bits for exponent, and 23 bits for mantisa. Similarly, float16 or fp16 allocates 1 bit for sign, but just 5 bits for the exponent and 10 bits for mantisa. On the other hand, bf16 allocates 8 bits for the exponent and just 7 bits for mantisa. Now, in the font representations, what I mean to say is the conversion from a higher memory format to a lower memory format is called quantization. Talking in deep learning terms, float32 is referred to as a single or full precision, and float16 and bf16 are called half precision. The default way in which deep learning models are trained and stored is in full precision. The most commonly used conversion is from this full precision to an int8 format. Quantization can be uniform or non-uniform. In the uniform case, the mapping from the input to the output is a linear function, resulting in uniformly spaced outputs for uniformly spaced inputs. In the non-uniform case, the mapping from the input to the output is a non-linear function, and so the outputs won't be uniformly spaced for a uniformly spaced input. Now diving into the uniform type, the linear mapping function can be a scaling or a rounding operation, or it could be both. And so, uniform quantization involves a scaling factor s in the equation. When converting from, say, float16 to int8, notice that we can always restrict the values to be between minus 127 and plus 127, and ensure that the zero of the input perfectly maps to the zero of the output, leading to a symmetric mapping, and this quantization is therefore called 
symmetric quantization. On the other hand, if the value on either side of zero are not the same, for example, minus 128 to plus 127, and additionally, if you are mapping the zero of the input to some other value other than zero at the output, then it's called asymmetric quantization. As we now have the zero value shifted in the input, we need to count for this in our equation by including the zero factor z in the equation. As a side note, let's not forget that we can always do a dequantization operation to go back to our original float value and our equation for dequantization becomes this. Note the tilde on top of the recovered value r, meaning that it's only approximately equal to the actual value r. And so we always have some quantization error, which is the difference between the actual and the dequantized value. Though this value is key in fields like signal processing, in deep learning, what we are concerned is the difference in metrics such as accuracy or perplexity. And these metrics play a key role when we want to choose the parameters like scale and 0.z for our quantization. To learn how we can choose the scale and zero factor, let's take an example input distributed like this in our real number axis. The scale factor essentially divides this entire range of the input right from the minimum value r min to the maximum value r max into uniform partitions. We can, however, choose to clip this input at some point, say alpha for negative values and beta for positive values. Any value beyond alpha and beta is not meaningful because it maps to the same output as that of alpha or beta. In this example, it's minus 127 and plus 127. The process of choosing these clipping values, alpha and beta, and hence the clipping range is called calibration. In order to prevent excessive clipping, the easiest option could be setting alpha to be equal to r min and beta to be equal to r max. And we can happily calculate the scale factor using these r min and r max values. However, this may render the output to be asymmetric. For example, r max in the input could be 1.5, but r min could be just minus 1.2. So to constrain to be symmetric quantization, we need to choose alpha and beta to be the max values of the two r min and r max. And of course, set zero point to be zero. Symmetric quantization is exactly what is used when quantizing neural network weights, as the trained weights are already pre-computed during inference and it won't change during inference. And computation is also simpler compared to asymmetric case as the zero point is equal to zero. Now let's take the example where the inputs are skewed to one direction, say to the positive side. This resembles the output of some of the most successful activation functions like ReLU or GALU. On top of that, outputs of activations change with the input. For example, the output of activation function for this image is quite different to that of this image of a cat. So the question now is, when do we calibrate the range for quantization? Is it during training or during inference as and when we get the input data for prediction? 
So this question gives birth to different modes of quantization based on when we calibrate the range. In post-training quantization, or PTQ in short, we start with a pre-trained model without further training it. The only data needed from the model is the calibration data to calculate the clipping range and hence the scale factor and zero point. This data in most cases comes from the model weights. Once we calibrate, we can then quantize the model and obtain the quantized model. In quantization aware training or QAT in short, we quantize the trained model using standard procedure, but then do further fine tuning or retraining using fresh training data in order to obtain the quantized model. QAT is usually done to adjust the parameters of the model in order to recover the lost accuracy or any other metric we are concerned about during quantization. So QAT tends to provide better models than post-training quantization. But remember that QAT also needs more training data. In order to do fine tuning, the model has to be differentiable. But quantization operation is non-differentiable. To overcome this, we use fake quantizers such as straight through estimators. And during fine tuning, these estimators estimate the error of quantization. And these errors are combined along with the training errors to fine tune the model for better performance. During fine tuning, the forward and backward pass are performed on the quantized model in floating point but then these parameters are quantized after each gradient update. So that covers pretty much the basics of quantization. We started with the need for quantization, the different types of quantization, such as symmetric and asymmetric. We also quickly learned how we can go about choosing the quantization parameters, namely the scale factor and the zero point and we ended with a different modes of quantization. But how is it all implemented in, say, PyTorch or TensorFlow? Well, that's for another day. I hope this video provides some insight on quantization in deep learning. I hope to see you in my next. Until then, take care.